Hmm. Okay. okay. I I have often had people talk to me about how they think God is hard and cold and narrow and they just attach these characteristics to God that are how they perceive him from what he requires of a believer or a, a person who is committed to him. So when they hear um, no partying, no sex outside of marriage, they hear these things and they immediately make a judgment against God that he is against pleasure, that he is against all of these things. And so I've asked these people, I said, when you got married or when you get married, if your spouse says, I'm going to do my best, but I think I can be 90% faithful to you, or I think I can be 85% faithful to you. And I ask how many would actually move forward into the marriage. And so far, no one has accepted. And I think, so why is that when God calls this a marriage and he asks for things and we say, well, you can't expect people to get there all at once. You can't expect people to just drop everything at once. It's really a long process for people to stop this, that, or the other thing. But at the same time, when you marry a human being, you expect it to stop that day. Whatever it was that you can't tolerate, no more dating apps, no more um, porn, no more whatever it is that's, that's got you um, thinking they're unfaithful, you expect them to stop immediately and completely. Yet somehow we think for God, there should be this long window of slowly walking up out of sin, but that's, God knows that we can do it for a human and that we humans expect it ourselves of our partner. So when we say this is a long process to become obedient to God, we need to examine what we're willing to tolerate in our marriage and how many excuses we're planning to give them because we don't want to live double-minded. We don't want to have a double standard between God and others if we're going to say, I want them to be faithful to me, but I personally am not going to commit 100% of my life to Jesus, then you yourself have condemned yourself. A person who is 90% faithful to their spouse is simply not faithful. And there is no such thing as part-time loyalty to Jesus Christ, just like you would never tolerate part-time loyalty in your marriage. And dying to self is never portrayed in the Bible as something that's optional to those who are committed to following Jesus, who are born again. Dying to self is mandated, and it's the reality of the new birth. So when you're born again, that's an automatic of what can happen if you're actually born again, you will die to self. You will start dying to self. So no one can come to Christ unless they have chosen to do that. They are willing to what we call crucify the old life. It's crucified with Christ. And we begin to live in this new committed relationship with Jesus that is obedient to him. It's not even optional. We don't come to Christ and then expect we're going to get a six month probationary window to somehow stop sinning in that window. There is, there are things that we grow through, but choosing to not sin is something that comes right away, just like in a marriage. You don't start sinning against your spouse. Jesus describes lukewarm followers who try to live partially in the old life and partially in the new one as those that he will spit out in Revelation 3, 15 through 16. And the determination to give our lives to God's service is called repentance. 
And in repenting, if you genuinely repent, there's only one way that can look, and that is to determine to turn completely from our own will to live lives to please God. That's it. It's not about saying you're sorry for your sin. That's confession. But repenting is, I was going this way, I turned, and I'm going this way. It's a complete turning the opposite direction. That's repentance. We cannot be saved without it. And that's why repentance is critical. When you're talking about salvation, if you think you're leading people to Christ, but you're not talking about repentance, you're deceiving them because repentance is required for salvation. So you have to talk about repentance. It also explains why so many people are not truly disciples, whether or not they claim to be disciples, many do. They have not been willing to make this complete sacrifice as in a marriage, a total dependence, a total loyalty, a total commitment to Jesus because nobody told them that they had to. That responsibility falls on anyone who's out there telling anyone with any authority how to come to Christ, and it better include that they have to leave their life of sin. Grayson Gilbert wrote, if you haven't yet heard, a recent survey re revealed that the majority of professing Christians do not believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone. And while it might be alarming to some, it should not shock us that the majority of professing Christians don't even know the gospel. Don't misunderstand me to be saying this is inconsequential. It isn't. It is disastrous. And it will prove to have eternal consequences on a rather large group of people who have little to no concept of what the, go the gospel actually teaches about the fundamental nature of mankind, the problem of sin and judgment, and yet how this problem is also resolved in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is profoundly significant. End of quote. So if someone is born again, the only way to heaven, self dies, no more self-interest. You make one choice to make every choice for Jesus Christ. You no longer have any rights to yourself. You know that everything you do is for the king, everything you do, or it's not. And in that case, you're not faithful. And this is the point of this message is part-time faithful is not faithful. It isn't his. And he pronounces a pretty fierce judgment on that. So denying yourself sounds simple enough. But for most, it's not that simple because their heart is still loyal to self. They keep self alive. They want to protect self, they want to promote self, they want to pleasure self. And for that reason, they have not been brought to the line of understanding that you can't do that. That's not even an option. Just like you won't allow it in your marriage for your spouse to run this whole second life. That's expected as a born again Christian. And I've met many men and women who avoid understanding this very important command, some by choice. They don't want to. They prefer not to listen to people who say it because the Bible's clear. They call people like me rigid, narrow, legalistic. But the facts are the Bible is clear and judgment is going to follow that instead of what people want it to say. They know in their marriage they want that kind of faithfulness, but they don't want to hear that it applies to their relationship with God and it's expected and it's very doable because we can do it for our marriage. Even just dating someone, oftentimes, we can be narrowly obedient and serving and worshiping them. We can do it immediately. So God knows that. He knows that we can do that. For who we love, he knows we can do it. We want to pick and choose how we will deny ourselves. So very few are reading the Bible anymore to understand that this is something so critical that it's going to come up when you meet God face to face. 
They believe that the limited truth they hear in church or Bible school from people that they trust, their pastors, their leaders, that they wouldn't lie to them about this. They say that. Why would they, why would they not say that if they are true pastors or leaders and that were the truth? they would say that they're in this role where they would say that so if it were true it would be said and they also don't realize that there's a Bible almost everywhere in every home that they're choosing to not read on their own or understand, which means that they are not hearing from God themselves. They're choosing to listen to man because they really most don't want to know the truth. And that's going to cost them. Someone told me recently that sitting in a year of schooling for ministry equaled their experience in Catholic school as a child, and I'm not bashing Catholic school. I feel it could happen in any religious school. That's just what they had been in. He said he felt no internal engagement or change, which he now attributes to the lack of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's simply men and women talking, no changing power present. And that, sadly, is religion. And religious spirits love that climate. It's a false imitation of the true kingdom. It is not Jesus. And it opposes Jesus. It opposes the true work of the kingdom. Because people become religious, but they don't want the Holy Spirit there because he shakes up their schedule. He shakes up their agenda. He shakes up their life. They don't want that. We have to keep this thing running on schedule. And if the Spirit isn't there bringing conviction over sin and pride, causing you no rest until you abandon your sin, and you literally hate the idea of doing it again, you may as well leave the ministry. Because all it's doing is causing you to hear truth, hear truth, maybe verses of truth, but your heart is getting harder and harder and harder, and it just sounds like racket because it has no power to change you, no power to convict you, you should leave immediately because you're hurting yourself for eternity. You're being conditioned into dead religion, which opposes the true King Jesus. If you haven't noticed, there's many current worship songs that are written from a self perspective. And I don't want to identify any specifically, but if you look at most, they, if you look at the old hymns, their theology is solid. It's, I purposely will pick up old hymnals at, at used bookstores just to read them. They are so life-giving and so amazing to read. But if you look at worship songs in this last 20 years, I actually watched The Decline and certainly talk to people about it, that... They're not singing in a clear way to worship Jesus in a way that is truthful about Jesus. There's a lot of about how I feel. It's focused from an I perspective instead of a Jesus is Lord perspective. And many of these worship leaders and singers are not born again they are gifted, tremendously gifted in music. They can even write amazing songs. And the devil will prosper one of his to mimic Christianity, to keep them in the position they're in so that the Holy Spirit is not there. And oftentimes I'm told they weren't good enough to become popular as a secular artist. So they crossed over into Christian and gospel because the standard was lower and they were able to make it and make a lot of money on that side. So they did it for self exaltation, self um, promotion. There's a lot of 
problems in the area of music. But if you listen to the lyrics and you listen to the message given by the lyrics, you want to make sure that the Bible is the focus, not an experience. It must be the Bible. And many former worship leaders and songwriters have openly admitted not knowing Jesus and being in it for the money and the fame. And we must let the spirit control every bit of worship, whether it's in deed or music. And if we don't, then it becomes against him. It lifts something else. And if people don't leave your worship service and run out and repent of their sin, walk away from immorality, um, fantasy, whether it's whatever that is on your phone that lures you in. If you don't abandon those things that are more important to you than Jesus from that music, it exalted self in many cases. You have to look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of the people who were amongst your worship. The fruit never lies. Attempting to control the Holy Spirit in any way will cause him to abandon you. And you're in danger for all of eternity until that is remedied. He is not going to be controlled by you. He is God. We are but specks. We are dust. We have absolutely zero right, ability, or the very thought of thinking that we can bargain out anything with God. I'm better than before. I'm not, at least I'm sober. I'm not having sex this week with random people. All of those things sound almost blasphemous when you look at the price that was paid by Jesus on the cross. For us, we should be silent. We should fall on our faces. We should be silent in worship. That is the least he deserves. And where the Holy Spirit isn't moving, the ability to understand that the things of God and grow in truth is virtually impossible. You will stay self-focused. You will stay self-serving. You will stay, um, there will be all kinds of division. There will be all kinds of chaos. The peace of God that passes all understanding will not be present. Luke 9.23 says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Romans 6.9, the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And Jesus said that to be his disciples, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and give our lives for him. And if we want to come after Jesus, we must deny self, take up our cross, follow Jesus. And this is further described in losing our life. Denying self requires us to give up anything that we would want or seek that would hinder our doing the will of God. That means all your personal opinions, all your personal resentments, all your personal, you have to deny those things. If you really are going to follow Jesus, you don't even have an option of personal rights, personal opinions, personal, there's, we are travelers in this world. We are not citizens here. We are citizens of a greater kingdom. And that kingdom is a united kingdom. And this does not mean that if we want something that it's necessarily wrong. It means we must take our wants and our desires to the throne and place Jesus and his will as the governing power and authority over all of our life. Everything we want, everything we need, it has to come under the governing, governing power of Jesus. And there's room in each life for only one master. God says that, and we also know that. This is, if in your home, 
you have, well, your, your spouse or one of your children says to you, you know what? I don't like half the rules you have in this house. I'm going to just do what I want. Some of them are okay. I'll, I'll follow those, but some of them I don't like. So I'm not going to do those. And if you're the head of that household, I can imagine what most people would say. You're not going to live here then. But see, if God is to rule our lives, the one who created us in his image, then our will must be made to submit to his, to be part of his family. Same thing as you would expect in your own home, and you're not even nearly as deserving of it as God. We must be willing to give up anything in life in order to please God. Anything. So if you look at what's going on in your head, you have to look at all your choices, especially when you're alone, and you imagine Jesus is actually living in you, if that's what you claim. You're forcing Jesus to have these conversations, to um, vape, to um, gossip, to slander. You're thinking that for some reason Jesus is going to participate, but he isn't. And so that's what it means is if you abandon following the Holy Spirit, he's going to leave. Dying to self is part of being born again. The old self dies and the new self comes to life. That's the spirit man. And not only are Christians born again when we come to salvation, but we also continue dying to self as part of a process of sanctification. As such, dying to self is both a one-time event and a lifelong process. So in my life, um, when I was born again, I, I had... A lifestyle that was <laughs> ridiculous before I came to Christ very in the clubs all the time and doing a lot of things that I would not expect that I could do when I was with Jesus so my friends were from the clubs also and so when I told some of my friends that I had been born again after I learned that from my chemical health assessor they said, I had two different ones within the first week say to me, no, no, you don't want to do that. No, you don't want to do that. I didn't even fully understand what born again meant, but they told me no. They said, don't do that. You don't need to take this that far. You don't need to go this far. You can quit drinking other ways, but you don't need to take such a drastic turn, forgetting that I had almost died a few nights earlier. They said, do you know what that means? You can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't do drugs, and you can't have sex. That's what they told me, and I thought, really? Okay, well, but I already knew God had taken away the smoking. Well, I didn't know it yet, but I hadn't been smoking. Um, I hadn't had a drop to drink for the first time in close to nine years. Um, Every single day prior to that, I had drank a lot, no drugs, and I also had to leave a relationship I had been in for a long time because I knew I couldn't keep it and have Jesus because it was a betrayal of him to keep that big a piece of my heart in the world. So I had to walk away from it. Very painful. It, it was terrible, terribly painful. But what's more painful is dying lost. Dying without Jesus, that is far more painful. So as I move along, and it looks like all of my sin was dealt with quickly, that's just crazy. Because the obvious things were dealt with. But there's all these other things. There's all these other sins of the heart, sins of the emotion. It is pride is such a terrible thing because it makes us quantify the value of another person. It makes us speak about people as if they weren't worth the life of Jesus to God. It makes us want favor with certain people, but other people we quickly overlook. There's so many things about us that are so selfish and so ridiculous that 
we just think is okay because nobody's checking it. Nobody is saying anything about a lot of things that are so offensive to God. If we ever look at another person with judgment, God is more offended by that than just about anything else. And that is something we need to be very careful of. We take up our cross and we follow Jesus. And many think that means bearing burdens and suffering hardships for Jesus. But hardship at times will happen. Um, we seem to be in quite a season of those right now. But the thing is, God's brought us through so many things already that we trust him. We just trust him. We know he is our protector. He always says, give the battle to me. I will defend you. Walk away. I am your defender. So we've learned very quickly to do that because we are tired of fighting battles that he said, I, I would have fought that for you. So now we're finally learning. It's taken us a while. So that sanctification process it's got so many different pieces to it, you wouldn't even believe it. It isn't about, I stopped my obvious addictions. It is far more complex. It'll take the rest of our lives. There's a fuller meaning to what it means to take up our cross because a cross is not just for a burden to be carried, it's far more than that. It's an instrument of death. It is an instrument of complete sacrifice. Jesus said, take up our cross and follow him. He bore a cross and we must also bear our cross in order to follow him and be called his. And that means taking up our cross refers to giving up our entire life to God as Jesus gave up his entire life for us. That involves bearing burdens, but it's a lot deeper. It is a total and complete dedication of our life to God. Our whole life is given to his service in anything he says, and this will lead us willingly to deny self. We will no longer have judgments against God about, well, why wouldn't you let me do that? I can't believe God has all these rules. We won't even think like that. We will be so abandoned to him, so um, passionate about pleasing him, and so... The, the living in the reward of, of Jesus is so incredible that I just can't even imagine anything being worth turning back. And following him requires us to live as he lived his life when he was here. He set the example for us to take up our cross daily. Christians must give up their lives, their rights to God every single day to be following Christ. And this is not necessarily a physical death as Jesus died for us, although some are dying a physical death. There's more martyrs today than there's ever been, but a daily total sacrifice of self to do the will of Jesus. And I used to say when I was a new believer, I would give my life for Jesus. I always tell him I, I would take a bullet for Jesus. If someone came in with a gun, I would take a bullet for Jesus. The one who gambled with death every single day of my sinful life, I'd say, yeah, I'll be a martyr for Jesus. Until someone stepped in front of me and said, okay, okay, we hear you. But if you really love Jesus, then live for him. Stop talking about I'll die for him. You try living for him. And that's where it gets tricky because most people say, I'll die for Jesus, but they won't live for Jesus. They won't live for him. So they won't die to self. They'll die if somebody comes up and kills them and say they did it for Jesus, but Jesus knows they did not. Whatever God wants with our life, that is what must be done with it. What we want no longer matters. But when we give ourselves to him, just as he gave himself for us, despite his human nature, he did not want to do it. He suffered terribly going to that decision. We are to do the same. Self must die. Self-interest must die. Self-promotion must die. Self-comfort must die. But those who would give up their lives for his sake will find eternal life and he says it's narrow and few will find it 
And indeed, Jesus went even so far as to say that those who are willing to sacrifice their lives for him cannot be his. Those who are unwilling cannot be his disciples. If you are not willing to give up your life for him, he says you cannot be his disciple. Baptism identifies us with Christ in his death and resurrection. It portrays symbolically the whole life of a Christian as dying to self and living for and in him who died for us. We must lose our life for Jesus. And for clarity, if a person holds his life so dear to himself that he wants to use it to please himself, to ever do his own will, to accomplish his own purposes rather than dying to self, and that could even be um, starting a mission or a ministry instead of serving God that person will in the end lose his life eternally if he even did great religious things but that wasn't what God asked him to do he did them because he wanted them he wanted that kind of an image or that kind of a reputation anyone who tries to build that way is in danger of hell fire god is offended when you try to look like he's doing something but he wasn't it wasn't him he may have asked you to be a laborer he may have asked you to take the holy spirit with you into a factory he maybe asked you to be a daycare operator to bring the holy spirit to children but when you pick and choose how you're going to resemble God and it isn't what he chose, the Holy Spirit is not with you. And at that point, you're at war with God. He hates that. Anyone who loses his life for Jesus' sake and gives it in service and sacrifice to God by denying himself, such a man will save his life by gaining eternal life. And there can be no greater or clearer teaching anywhere in the Bible about what a true disciple really is. And this is how Jesus lived. And it is also how he said his disciples must live. He was fully man and he set the example for us in a culture that isn't nearly as convenient as the one we have. And he was persecuted from the beginning of his life, even before he was born. We must live lives of complete and total submission to the will of God. And Paul explains to the Galatians the process of dying to self in which he has been crucified with Christ. And now Paul no longer lives, but Christ lives in and through him. Paul's old life with its propensity to sin and to follow the ways of the world, he calls dead. And the new Paul is the dwelling place of Christ who lives in and through him. And this does not mean that when we die to self, we become inactive or we no longer sense life, nor do we feel dead in our life. Rather, dying to self means that the things of the old life were put to death. Hard stop, no more. Most especially the sins and lifestyles we once engaged in. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires, Galatians 5.24, where we once pursued selfish pleasures, we now pursue with equal passion that which pleases God and that lukewarm condition characterized by the church of Laodicea as many churches just don't even seem to see the warning in that today. Lukewarm is a symptom of unwillingness to die to self and live fully for Jesus Christ. And death to self is not an option. For Christians, it is a choice that leads to eternal life and not doing so leads to death. There's a number of verses about denying to self that I'm going to put in the comments. So I'm just going to add those and you can check the comments as soon as this is done because I will put in a very long list of verses. There are ways, biblical ways, to deny yourself, written by Ed Taylor. We must learn to daily, moment by moment, give up our literal and perceived rights and choose to follow Jesus. And here are just some of the rights the true Jesus follower must surrender. And these are biblically not negotiable. One, we give up the right to take revenge. Romans 12, 19 to 20. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. 
for the Bible says, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Two, we give up the right to have a comfortable, secure home in life. Luke 9, 57 to 58 says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. You are not entitled or permitted a comfortable home. If he calls you to something for himself and to leave that home, you need to leave that home. You should never love your property so much that you will not leave it when Jesus calls you to leave it. You will always want another location if you are focused on the home because whenever the culture changes and this new thing, you're always gonna be focused on the home. We are not to do that. They're a dwelling here. I used to work closely with Salvation Army leaders when I worked in the jails and the prisons and they told me at the time, I don't know how it is now, but they said the heads of Salvation Army have to be able to move in one night. And if they can't, they're never going to be asked to be, I think it's called a colonel, I'm not sure, but it's a title where they have to have already shown that they can pack up in their vehicle and move their family in one night. Three, we give up the right to a good reputation. Matthew 5, 11, God blesses you when people mock you, persecute you, lie about you, and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're his follower. So you don't have to run around defending yourself. God himself will do that if you don't. Four, we give up the right to spend money however we please. Matthew 6, 19 to 21, do not store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. And again, people will sit for hours a day and study their stocks, they'll study their, their portfolios, they will study every which way their money is going up or down. Every minute of that could be spent sharing Christ with someone else, even over social media. But instead, their heart is in their money, and I don't, I don't have any issue with people making wise money decisions, but when you spend more time tracking your funds and watching your portfolio than you do building the kingdom forever and getting as many people into heaven as you can, you are deceived, the enemy has derailed you, that you would focus your life on building something that's going to burn in the end and it's also going to show that you had zero fruit for all the time that God was probably trying to bring people in your path. We must make sure that what we're doing is building the kingdom of God. Now, if your money is being spent to missionaries and building all of these different ways where people are outreaching Jesus. That's a different thing because most of us don't have any money and our miss our missions are hopefully somebody gives us money to operate. So there's people that are gifted in building wealth to fund missionaries. That is their actual calling. But if that's not what you're doing with it, you got trapped. You are trapped and the eternal consequence will be terrible for that. Everything we have belongs to God. There is not one thing in our life that belongs to us. Your children don't belong to you. Your spouse belongs to God first. You will answer for every single thing that you have been given to steward here, your finances, um, people, opportunities that God placed in front of you, whether you saw them or not, we will answer for all of the things. None of it is ours. All of it is his. And we were all given an opportunity to steward well or to focus on self and me, 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 thinking for some crazy reason that it was yours. It's not going to follow you. 
it's his. Another, we give up the right to hate an enemy. Matthew 5, 43 through 47, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you would be acting as a true child of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even t corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Six, we give up the right to be honored and served. Mark 10, 42 through 45. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you're in a position that you feel is lording over people, not leading, that's different, but where you're bossing up, and feeling higher than, better than, you're mishandling your position. You're certainly not following Jesus. Leading Jesus' way means serving. Serving up, not down. Seven, we give up the right to understand God's plan before we obey him. Hebrews 11.8 it says, by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home, go to another land that God would give him as in his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going and why and what was going to happen there. He did not know. He just went. Eight, we give up the right to live by our own rules. John 14, 23 to 24, Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and they will come and make our home with and we will come and make our home with each one of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the father who sent me. 9. We give up the right to hold a grudge. Colossians 3:13. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And that's not a option for heaven. If you hold on to unforgiveness, bitterness and resentment, you're disqualifying yourself from heaven. Jesus said that. 10. We give up the right to complain. Um Philippians 2.14, do everything without complaining and arguing. First um, Thessalonians 5.18 says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. 11, we give up the right to put ourselves first. Philippians 2, 3 through 4, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others. 12, we give up the right to express one's sexuality freely. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20 says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, Jesus. You must honor God with your body. And that is another deal breaker. Sexual immorality, porn addiction, disqualify you from heaven unless you repent and turn and walk away from it it's it's not people want to be understood in the struggle for addiction i've been in severe addictions i get it but i can tell you that god knows how much effort we will give to something when we want it when we want it for some reason god knows how far we will go to get it when it's attainable 
What he also knows is when you say you're struggling with a sexual addiction and you're just living your life with the computer there or you're still going out and meeting people, whatever the action part of that is, if you're continuing to act on it, you are not struggling. You're acting on it. Struggling is what happens when you stop. Struggling is how you move ahead when you have slammed the door. Now you're struggling. Anything before that where you're continuously giving into it, that is not struggling. That is not repentant. That is not giving it up. That is completely willfully pursuing it at that point. 13, we give up the right to rebel against authority. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15, for the Lord's sake submit to human authority, whether the king is head of the state or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. So if your authority is making you disobey God, then you don't disobey God. You obey God and you take your lumps, whatever that means. Many people have been put out of their career jobs. They've been, there's many people that have had to leave hard, hard, lots of labor laid, lots of work done because they were asked to disobey. Don't disobey God for anyone, but honor your authority. So I always wonder about people who, and, and I understand if you don't like who the current president is, I mean, that it happens every election, you have that, but how much, how profitable is it to spend the entire duration of that president's term saying he doesn't deserve the office or the whatever? It, it is like when you stand before God and you know that he wasn't sitting down there fixated on any country's election that there's a point where we have to accept and stay focused on the kingdom you can't just get so caught up in something that you no longer are out representing Jesus because our whole mission and purpose in life is to represent Jesus and I don't see Jesus getting all bogged down in in things that are not going to draw people into the kingdom for all of eternity we need to stay focused on building the kingdom staying on task and there's many people that I used to actually respect and love how they went out and did evangelism who are no longer even doing it because they're on and they're just they've gotten sucked into an agenda that really I mean it's important but it certainly isn't eternally important we look at countries across the world where they're in hostile territory all the time the Christians are despised and hated and driven underground they cannot say the name of Jesus without being murdered. God did not tell us that we are owed this peaceful, free country because many countries do not have that. That's why they all come here because most countries don't have it. And they are martyred and persecuted for their faith. And people are so drawn to them because they see them willing to pay that price. We could learn some things from them because they didn't keep their focus on the leadership of our country it is is terrible we need to go out and they really kept their focus on the one true king and pulling as many people as they could with their life into worship to that king mark 8 36 says for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but he loses his own soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I've seen that on billboards. That is a that is a major heavy verse in the Bible. 
What are we willing to give? If we were offered the whole world, what if we were offered our city as our own personal property to do what we want with it? Would it be worth losing our own soul? And what I know happens is people are willing to lose their own soul for a lot less than that. They'll lose it for a relationship. They'll lose it for an addiction. I'm not saying addiction makes you lost, but a lot of people prefer their addiction, serving self-pleasure over Jesus. That makes you lost. There's, a, there's room to be political. There's nothing wrong with that. There's room to have any kind of influence you can in this world. But when you put it first and Jesus second, you have now put Jesus out. So it's very important that we keep Jesus first because it's the only position he takes. It's the only position he deserves. And it's the only position he will accept. Precious Lord, I take every day of my life so seriously and I thank you every day for letting me get to such a dark deep hole that I could not get out it got burned into me that my life is not my own and I'm not going to use it for any other reason but to rescue others Thank you that you have been so good to me. Thank you that you have kept Tati and I in the palm of your hand, that you have taught us so much and that you are still teaching us so much. We love you, Jesus. The only thing we want is to please you. We just want you pleased with us. That's it. We'll pay any price to keep that. So we pray for every future day of our life. We commit it to you. We commit all of our battles to you. We will choose to spread the gospel and let you handle our battles. That is where we want to be. So I pray for everyone who hears this, that you will please put a sense in people of how short time is. There's absolutely nothing to be focused on except your very soon return and how many people are not ready. They're not watching for you, Jesus. They're not ready. I ask that you help us to maximize every minute of our time, to shout your name, to carry your Holy Spirit everywhere we go. I ask that you would help us to bring healing, deliverance, wholeness, joy, hope, peace, freedom to everyone we meet. That is all we want to do. So we bless you, God. We thank you for every good thing because that's all we've ever gotten from you is good we ask all of this in jesus name amen